Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. Uh, in today's episode of how to build a compiler with LLVM and MLIR, we're going to have the second part of the JIT engine. In the part one, we discussed the Serene's JIT engine and basically I showed you some of the implementations that I had for uh, the JIT engine. And in today's episode, we're going to wrap things up and kind of uh, talk about the bigger picture and for the uh, and the future plan. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the code that we uh, skipped in the uh, previous part. So uh, let's get things going by talking about the differences that Serene has with other program languages. First of all, Serene is a Lisp. And being a Lisp means that it's dynamic by nature. Unlike other program languages like, uh, sorry, unlike other compilers, uh, like i don't know like c c c plus plus compilers rust compilers go golang compilers um serene compiler is dynamic it should be dynamic so uh for example when you use a c compiler let's say clang and you try to compile your project what happens is the compiler actually reads your pro uh, code like um, read all the source codes in your uh, project and pass it to a parser, parse it, compiles it to some sort of IR, and finally compiles it to native code, uh, some uh, target code, sorry, and dump it into a binary file. We talked about this in uh, very first episodes, few first episodes, but in general, uh, a C compiler never runs your code, right? Your code only runs at runtime so there's a like a clear distinction between compile time like the time that your compiler is active and compiles your code into a target code and runtime which is the time that your compiled code uh, is running right but serene is different since it's a lisp the compile like we need to run code on compile time as well I'm going to show you uh, kind of how we do it, we want to do it, but that means um, we have to take care of our compilation time as well. We have to run stuff in our compilation time. So our, like our uh, compile time is kind of the same thing as the runtime, can be the same thing, right? So on its core, Serene is just the JIT engine. We're going to like, we're going to work on our JIT engine, make it better and add functionalities to it and run that JIT engine on compile time to achieve the same thing as a, like a static compiler will uh, do for us. And then when we do that, the, it opens the door for other possibilities as well. So we can actually run the same um, JIT engine on, only on runtime and forget about the compile time. That kinds uh, like that, the notion of uh, running the JIT engine at compile time versus runtime kind of uh, makes it harder to like to draw the border borderline between like compile time and runtime in case of Siri. I drew a uh, diagram and uh, please excuse my um, lack of, what do you call it, uh, technical skills to create fancy diagrams. So um, it is really hand wavy and only uh, the purpose of this diagram is to show you where the JIT engine sits, right? So. In terms of Serene, we have two kind of gateways to our compiler. One is a CLI interface like Serene C. We pass parameters to it. We ask, we ask it to compile a namespace for us. For example, we say, yeah, go, go ahead and find the namespace foo.bar and compile it for me, right? And another, uh, sorry, and another, uh, input uh, like another gateway that we have is the REPL environment either we are in interactive mode or we are like a network socket or something users can actually uh, spin up a REPL and interact with the compiler with the language not the compiler uh, that way 
the interim uh, forms into like an interactive rappel and ask the language to actually evaluate the forms so um first of all let's talk about the cli interface when uh, when we try to uh use the cli interface to compile a namespace what happens is the C the cli interface or the CLI, cli program actually will resolve the namespace name into a file uh, it's going to read the file and pass the content to our parser via the read function and gets uh, like a form of st and then it's going to pass the data st to the semantic analysis and run the analysis uh, like a semantic analysis phase on it to generate some valid AST. So by this point, the valid AST contains a semantically correct AST that represents the input program, like the namespace, or in terms of, uh, in case of REPL, the input form. Um, so as we saw in the previous part, like in part one of the JIT engine, um, our JIT engine had a function, like two functions actually, add AST and add NS. We can, uh, we can call uh, either of those functions to add the valid AST into our JIT engine. So you might remember when we call that uh, any of those functions, what happens is like we used to, like, we compile the AST into LLVM IR indirectly, like via SLIR, MLIR and LLVM IR and sorry i'm not a i can't use the mouse i have to use the keyboard um so basically um when we, uh, in the previous episode we ended uh, everything around here we compiled uh, compiled everything into llvm ir and we added uh, that like we compiled the llvm ir into native code as well and add that to the jitlib uh, but we ignored uh, and we skipped over this part so let's move back and uh, start over from the valid AST eventually when we uh, add the notion of macros into, into Serene what happens in this uh, like in this step is that we're going to look for macros in our AST if you don't know what a list macro is basically it's a function that runs on uh, compile time and it returns like valid Lisp forms and uh, we replace the like macro call with the return value which is uh, like a valid Lisp code and since it happens on compile time that's a like a neat way to extend your compiler it, it's it's really useful if you're a Lisper you already uh, love macros I'm pretty sure um, but we're going to go over the details in the future when we get to macros, but for now, just a function that runs on compile time and returns uh, returns a list of valid um, list forms. So we try to find any macro calls in our valid AST. If there was any macro calls, we're going to look up the required symbols to compile. Uh, basically, it should be already compiled, any symbols that we, we want to look for into in our uh, JIT dialib. If you remember from the previous episode, JIT dialib is like any, every namespace might have few JIT, lib, uh, JIT dialibs attached to it. So we have to look over all the JIT dialibs, find the symbols that we want. If there wasn't there, it means we have to kind of uh, throw an er error to the user. But we're going to find, uh, if we want to find the symbols, we're going to actually pass the symbols to um, pass the symbols to um, like we're going to execute the symbols right execute the functions that assign to that symbol and since it's a macro we're going to get a, like a list form back basically and we're going to again parse that one and we're going to end up with a valid AST then this cycle is going to like loop we're going to loop over this cycle until there's no macro left in our uh, valid ast like this thing is called like the, this loop is called macro expansion right we're going to expand the macros to the original like to the form that they uh, evaluate to so by the, uh, when we take care of all the 
macros, then we're going to go through the same process as the previous episode, compile everything to LLVM IR and wrap any top level function into a new function um, function call. And finally compiles everything to a target code, native code. And if like in this case, since we are running the JIT engine in compile time, we're going to execute a function called compile, for example, let's name it compile or dump, which is going to dump it to a binary format. And like that binary file can be executable file, shared libraries, whatever. Or in case of a REPL session, we're going to print the, like execute the code, execute that form. Since we already wrapped it in a function call, a function, function and function call, executing the code means call that function, like print out the, print the result to the user. And finally, since it's a, a REPL loop over and read more uh, input forms and pass it uh, to the semantic, like parse the around semantic analysis. So this is how I like I picture it and um, eventually in the future we're going to have a fancy JIT engine that takes care of everything for us. We run it on in compile time to actually uh, compile the code and generate binaries for us just like any other compiler and actually this thing opens uh, so many like open the door to so many possibilities for us. For example, we can actually run the same JIT engine at runtime. We won't have any compile time anymore. So the runtime and compile time would be the same. And that makes our JIT engine like to act like an interpreter, right? To act like an interpreter. We can pass it some serene code and it's going to run the serene, uh, the code uh, as it goes along, like on the fly. Um, that's quite exciting. Uh, it makes it quite flexible. Actually, like another possibility uh, is to run multiple JIT engines al alongside each other for different purposes. Um, in in my head, it, like this single feature makes it re like makes it really exciting. It's it makes it really flexible, but at the same time, it makes it more like. It, makes the compiler itself more complicated than uh, like a static language um, because we have to take care of more details uh, especially when we, we're trying to compile this stuff um that's why i like in the past two months uh, i tried to uh, wrap my head around some of the ideas that i have for the jit engine um, to implement them in mlir but um, i had a hard time doing it but uh, I'm going to get there eventually. So um, that's a big. That's the big. big uh, that's the uh, big picture. Let's move on, and I'm going to show you some of the code that we skipped in the previous episode. But as a heads up, um, heads up, I'm going to show the like the identical code from ML MLIR's Jet Engine, not Serene's, because I had to disable some of the parts. Uh, you know because of the wiring singing again like we want a basic com basic compiler wired up um so i can't like if i want to go with the serene uh, version which is identical kind of to the mlir's version since i disabled some parts i it won't it won't be uh, useful to you folks but if you check out the git repository afterward you, you, you'll see that they're quite uh, similar to each other so we have to move to the LLVM project directory, MLIR, include MLIR again, and execution engine. There's a header file called execution engine.h. Um, this is actually a JIT engine for MLIR. It reads MLIR and executes the MLIR code, right? Um, any dialect you pass to it. It's, it's really similar to the JIT engine that we have. It, it wraps around LLJIT as well. It has an object cache, um, really similar, right? I, I chose to show you this because I actually used some of this code in our JIT engine. I modified it to work with the name and spaces. I add the add NS and uh, add AST functions, but like uh, with some uh, certain specific stuff or JIT engine is built around this version. So 
there's like two uh, lookup uh, functions one is to look up a symbol normally and the other one is to look up the packed version of the uh, the same symbol i'm going to show you the um definition as well there's a invoke packed function that i'm going to show you but as you can see there's a, like a term packed here it's kind of uh, uh common era around these fun these functions um so to get there we need to go over some um, data structures the first one is a data structure called argument that represents all the arguments that we pass to a function it has a um, member function called pack which gets an r like a vector of arguments um, that contains uh, fake pointers and the value of type t and all it does it just adds that uh, uh, the pointer of that type to the list of arguments the vector of arguments we pass to it right since it's opaque uh, since the um, args vector contains only opaque pointers that should be fine similarly we have another uh, struct called um, result that represent the result value uh, sorry the return value of the function that we we're trying to invoke um it has a, like a it holds a pointer to that uh, to the return value as well um a result function uh, that return a result type right this thing uh, like we use this function to like, actually before i tell you how it works i need to show you the invoke function itself and a um, specialization for the argument struct that gets the result type it just return the pointer to the value um, what do you call it in C++ uh, value attribute of the result struct right um, and finally the most important function invoke so as I showed you in the diagram whenever we add something to the to the JIT engine we can use the invoke function to actually invoke the compiled code and call the function right so here it takes a function name and a vector a collection of arguments um we, get, uh, we have a, like an adapter name that's not important um but we, we actually create a new array like we create a, new, a small vector small vector is a type in llvm which is faster supposed to be more efficient than std vectors it contains opaque pointers and we just pack all the function we call the pack uh, member function on the argument struct and all the args that we got from here we pass it to the uh, args array uh, to the pack member function to create and uh, create a vector of opaque pointers to those arguments right and we call we call invoke pack uh, function we pass the adapter name which is basically the function name a modified version of the function name and the new vector of our opaque pointers to all the all the arguments right um easy till now nothing special oh by the way since we're talking about the invoking process we assume that we already packed the functions right i'm going to show you how do we pack the functions at the end but first let's look at how we invoked uh, how we can invoke a packed function so if we have a look at the packed uh, version uh, of invoke basically we get the name as the first uh, argument and we get get that vector of opaque pointers that points to the arguments as the second argument of this function then we use uh, lookup pack to look up the function name since we like the way we pack the function is to wrap it in another function we give that another like that wrapper function a new name uh, i'm going to show you in a little bit and the lookup pack is just the lookup but it's going to look up for uh, that wrapper function not the function that we wrapped um, if the function pointer wasn't there, uh, like if there wasn't any symbol like that, return an error, otherwise call that function pointer and return the data of the arguments to the function pointer. So, and finally, uh, return uh, success because if it returns, a, if it writes an error, it's, uh, 
doesn't matter because if we call the function normally as well, it's going to throw some exceptions. So that's fine. And it returns the return type uh, in a different way. I'm going to show you how it's going to work in a bit. But basically, that's how we run, uh, we invoke a function in our JIT engine. The tricky part is how to how we can actually wrap the function, uh, but invoking it is not that hard. The only thing that is remaining that I'm going to show you is actually this. Let's have an example of how this invoke function works. Let's say we have a function foo takes an argument, only one argument of type i32, return an i32 as a result, right? The way we can use the invoke function is to first we need a variable to store the result value, right? We create, since we know it already returns an i32, we create a, uh, we define a variable uh, of type in 32, store zero in it. And then we invoke, we use the invoke function to call that uh, foo function. We pass it the name as a string, foo, the only argument, which is like 42. And finally, we use the result function that we defined here, right, to mark, kind of to mark the where do we want to store the result of that function call. So, uh, function call, sorry. So we have, we defined a function, um, sorry, a variable result here, and that's where we want to store the return value. That's how we mark it as, uh, like, that's how we tell invoke to store the result what it how like basically when we pack the function we're going to create an array of uh, pointers to all the arguments and the final element would be a pointer to the return type if it's not void right so the final argument is going to be uh, a pointer to a variable that we want to store the return value in it so that's how we use invoke, but let's have a look at how do we actually pack your stuff. Do, do, do. So, um, yes. Sorry, I make, <laughs> I make some. Um, so here's how we actually uh, pack your stuff. We pass it like we have a function called pack function arguments and we pass uh, pass an llvm uh, pass a llvm module to that function um first of all if you don't like this might sound like looks a little bit uh, intimidating to you but don't worry about it if you don't understand uh, some of the concepts in this function it's totally fine it's all about like uh, llvm ir and how it works in the near future in, in like few uh two, three episodes uh, in the future, uh, we're going to talk about MLIR, LLVM, and like you're going to get them eventually. But for now, the main purpose is for you to know how do we actually wrap the function. The details we're going to, like I'm going to show you in the future or you can study in your own time. Um, so we get the LLVM context stored in the CTX. We create a builder. The builder object basically is just an object that creates the LLVM IR for, for us. And then we create a set, like dense set. It's just a LLVM type similar to a set that holds pointers to the function type, like LLVM function types, and we name it inter interface function. Whenever we process a function, we're going to insert it in this function to keep track of what function did we already process. And then uh, we're going to go through, iterate over all the functions in the module that we want to actually pack. Uh, the, um, so for each function, it's either a declaration. It means that it's just a signature. We like the definition lies somewhere else and we, we're not like we don't care for those functions. We don't want to pack them because they're external to our module. They might be already packed. We don't know. Um, and finally, if you already process the function, let's just skip over that one as well. And here's uh, uh, where the magic happens. We create a new function type, right? We call it new type. It's a, it's a function type that returns, actually, why? Yes, that's true. It returns, um, void 
returns void it doesn't return anything and the only argument that it has is a pointer i have to use the mouse it's a pointer to a pointer of type i8 a byte right so basically this thing in here right so a pointer to a pointer of type i8 or a pointer to an array of type i8 pointers right um and oh yeah and whenever we like if the function name is foo we're going to since we're going to wrap it in the uh, we're going to name the wrapper function mlir underline foo basically we change the name to avoid any uh, collisions so we have a new function type we pack the name the way we pack the name is super easy we just add um, mlir string um, as a prefix to the name and then we add that uh, function to our uh, module. We didn't uh, add the body yet, but we just add the function name and the type to our module. And then we create the function itself, like the body of the function. Uh, oh, we, we create the function first. We invert it uh, uh, into the set that we have, we had already just to keep track. And finally, down to the body we go, first we create the basic block uh, the entry block um, we uh, we add the basic block to the function that we just created um, then we ask the builder to start inserting the in instructions into our uh, building block so, <laughs> sorry basic block and finally like um, don't worry if you don't understand uh, understand this we're going to get there uh, like talk about it in the future like near future but what happens is we, we create a small vector of type pointers to values uh we name it args uh, this eight here is basically with a small vectors you can say pre pre-allocate like this num like this many uh, slots for in my vector right which is eight here um and then we go like we iterate over all the function arguments we create a pointer to uh, that argument and add, use that pointer uh, like the way i described earlier like we're going to create an array of pointers uh, for arguments and the very last one is going to be the return time and this is how we actually create the return type we get the uh, we create the call to the function this is where where actually we call the function right R right now we created the function to like the function uh, signature we created the basic blocks we took care of all the arguments and at the end uh, we created like a function call to the original function like the, that's how we uh, wrap things like wrap a function right we get the result if the result type wasn't void if it's void we don't care right but if it wasn't void and the function actually returns a type uh, returns a value we create the we go over the sim, uh, go over the, uh, similar process as our arguments and we create a new pointer for that return type as the final argument to this function so we look at like we take the final argument if it was like a it should be a pointer we just store the value um, in, in that pointer right we store the value in the pointer but uh you probably don't know what is a store what's load gap or uh, other stuff again i'm going to show you in the near future but in order to understand that we need to know some of the basics about compilers like um cfg is basically some data flow graphs and stuff like that like compiler stuff right um it's, it's it would be better to go through them first and then uh, talk about LLVMIR, like it would be much easier to understand all this. But for now, you got the bigger picture of how to, like, why do we wrap the functions and how, how do we do it? And finally, since our wrapper function is not going to return anything, we create a return word. And that's how we actually um, wrap functions. But why do we do it? The first thing is we need to wrap all the top level forms in uh, serene because you know uh, you can in a lisp you can just um, in a, in a file you can just start to write some list like this for example right 
nothing prevents you from doing that like a, you know it's very similar to a, like a uh, dynamic language like python you can just start writing in a file and uh, pass it to the interpreter we should be able to compile all this so we're going to wrap any top level um, this has a return type it's an expression right uh, we wrap it in a function we call it we get the return type of this thing and that would be the return time for uh, this form that's uh, one reason the other reason is because we want to use like when we want to use the invoke function it would be easier for us to have a uniform signature for all the functions right and use everything in the same like call everything in the same way rather than trying to guess like what the return type actually we have to guess the look up the return type of everything but it would be on us to do it not on the jet engine that's uh one of the other reasons that um we do it so uh that's it for today and basically for our discussion about uh jet engine at this point i guess like we're done with the wiring with the compiler wi wiring that it took us like 19 episodes to get there we have all the like important components of a compiler in place with the minimal uh, set of features they connected to each other they work more or less and we have <clears throat> we have a better insight into uh, different subsystems now it would be a good time to start uh, working on um, like details of each section make every sub like make the different subsystems the way we want but again i i think like the better uh, design would be to move like to expand our uh, compiler little by little we can't spend time, a lot of time in just one subsystem make it perfect and move to another one we have to kind of work on all of them at the same time um with that in mind in the next episode like next two maybe episodes i'm going to talk about table gen which is not related like is which is not the next step in our uh, uh, process but uh, in our like journey to create a compiler but that's something that would be really helpful we're going to create the error uh, error messages that we want using tables gen and after that we'd go, we're going to go through some of the basics of compilers that i mentioned like cfgs the data flows like different type of optimizations and things like that and finally get uh, to work to work, build the slir make slir better use llvm uh, mlir and llvm together and uh, move toward our goal which is a uh, working certain compiler um thank you uh it's episode number 19 it's amazing that uh I couldn't believe that I can make 19 episodes on compilers um, and it's all thanks to you folks. Uh, if you like what I do, please uh, consider to subscribe to my channel and leave a like. It's going to help me a lot with, uh, with my work and hope to see you in other episodes as well. Thank you.